Hi, everybody. Um, we do have some people attending online, so um, it's important that we go ahead and try and start on time for them. Sorry for the rush. Um, I would like to introduce to you today, Greg. He is, um, he's gonna talk to us about the three keys to investing in rental properties passively. So we're really privileged to have him here. Not only is he a Longwood um, native, all the way here from Jacksonville, but his success is just incredible. Like I'm, I'm actually a little nervous, as you can tell, just being in front of him, being able to introduce him to you guys because he's been so successful in this space. Um, I typically don't read a lot of the background in the bio, but all of it is so impressive that I'm going to do it anyway, okay? So he is the co-founder and CEO of JWD Real Estate Companies. Look that up. Serves over a thousand clients that come to them from 43 states and 13 countries. That's crazy. My mentor, my father-in-law, we're looking at like five states and I think he's on the moon, you know? So <laughs> currently manage over 350 million in assets, including turnkey rental properties and private lending. So not only are they involved in the turnkey rental side, which is the easiest way to invest passively in your self-directed IRA, IRA. Um, they also have the private lending arm. So that's awesome. Purchased over 3,000 investment properties, renovated over 2,000 properties, built over 500 new construction homes. Like, is there anything they haven't done in this space? It sounds like a one-stop shop. Over 3,000 properties under management. They build, sell, and provide property management services for rental properties that our clients invest in to build their passive income streams. So everybody welcome. Greg, Nelson, oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Go and, um, thank you. Candace, thank you. Give me a big hug. Thank you so much. That was the most wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. How are we all doing today? Uh, so, really cool story. As as uh, Candace was telling you, I literally grew up just down the road from here. I was sharing this with some of the guests that arrived earlier today, but I hadn't seen the house that I grew up in in over 20 years, and. Uh, and so I'm so excited to be here today. I'm taking a little trip down memory lane, came down earlier today, went and I shot a video of the house for my mom. I did a little FaceTime with my mom. She hadn't seen the house in so long. So I'm just really excited to be here today. Very thankful for the opportunity. I want to applaud all of you for being here and all of you in webinar land for being here as well. You know, whether this is something that's new for you, whether you are investing in rental properties for the first time or whether you're looking to take your portfolio from 10 properties to 50 properties, Half of the battle is showing up, right? And we're all busy. So I, I applaud you all for being here. Thank you all for being there online today. Uh, and you should feel really good about the steps you're taking today. And I knew that coming in. I want to make the best use of your time that we have here today. And I had a ton of fun preparing for this presentation. I put a lot of thought into the stories that I've either experienced myself or the clients that I've worked with and some of their stories. And so if it's okay with you, we're going to share a lot of stories today. There are going to be a few things that I know are going to be impactful for you. Again, whether this is a relatively new thing for you, or if you are looking to take this rental property portfolio idea and make it the basis of your financial wealth, there's going to be a lot here for you today. Is that okay with everybody? Cool. Well, um, so I'm going to start off with a little bit about my story here. Let me make sure I got this thing working here. I'm a little intimidated by the fancy technology that we have here. And uh, of course, it's not exactly cooperating. What do I need to do to turn the slides here? <laughs> We're good now. All right, there we go. So we got the only technology glitch out of the way, so we feel pretty good now. So um, let's tell you a little bit more about my story here. So you know, I grew up just, just down the road from here. Um, but my story really started to take shape in uh, 2006. I'm going to take you back there. So I just graduated from the University of Florida. I went to go and work for Corporate America, which was located in Jacksonville. And that's actually how I ended up in Jacksonville. I went to go get a job there. Quickly found out that corporate America was not for me. Um, and I was looking for something different. Ended up connecting with uh, some great mentors and, and, and started this real estate company with a few friends of mine. Uh, that was back in 2006. And who was here was investing in 2006? Raise your hand if you owned any properties in 2006. Okay, so some, some of us have, you have sir? Okay, um, when was it, what was it like in 2006? Was the market really hot? Market was really hot. So if you're a 20-something coming into starting your own real estate company in 2006, 
and you go out there and you start selling properties relatively easy, I'm thinking this thing is really like, I'm thinking I'm awesome at this, right? I think that real estate's easy. I'm like, man, I'm so glad I left this corporate job. Like, this is going to be great. And so that's what my business partners and I thought about rental properties, or excuse me, about real estate in general. That's what everybody thought in 2006, right? It was really easy to be profitable in 2006. And so I remember, you know, tr trying this real estate thing out. We were trying everything though. We were wholesaling. Put, put your hands in the air if you've done any of these real estate strategies. I'm going to try and name every single one of them. I may forget a few, right? Wholesaling, rehabbing. Uh, right, there we go. We've got some folks that have done, done all those. You know, lease options, rental properties. Obviously, I did that. Um, you know, you name it, we were doing it. And, and it, was a, it was kind of a natural thing in that time because when you're starting, when you're 20 something starting out and you don't have real estate experience, you don't have a big bankroll, you're trying to survive, right? You're trying to figure it out along the way. And that was us. So we did a little bit of everything. Um, one thing that I'm most happy that we did back in 2006 is we started to buy rental properties. So we bought about 40 rental properties. It was myself and my two business partners at that time. And we built our, what we thought was going to be our retirement my our retirement. That was not the business that we were in at that point to, you know, make the money to, 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 to keep the lights on at that point. We were focused on all these other strategies, but that was our retirement. We, we understood the power of building a rental property portfolio and, and doing that and seeing the compounding effects of that over time. And so we were focused on everything else other than rental properties. And then 2007 happened, right? 2007, 2008, 2009. What happened in 2007, 2008, 2009? Did the market go up or did it go down? And market tanked, right? So again, put yourself back in these shoes, right? I left corporate America, I left this safe job. My parents were all happy about me having this safe job. I went out and I started this real estate company thing in 2006. I bought 40 rental properties, did everything else there. And then everything tanked, right? It was a very difficult time in my life. Lost a lot of money. Lost over a million dollars in one year. That was just the worst year. There were a lot of other years I lost a lot of money. Um, I remember... Uh, what really bothered me and, and still kind of affects me emotionally today more than the money that I lost. I didn't, I was young. I knew I'd recover, but I felt like I was letting everybody down. I felt like all those people that were sort of making fun of me for leaving corporate America were right. I felt that I was letting my parents down. I felt like my girlfriend at that time who has now become my wife. felt like I was letting her down. Listen, most of the people who were investing with me in the early stages were all my family anyways. <laughs> so I was worried about losing their money. Um, and it was a really difficult time. I'm sure some of you can relate. If you were owning rental properties in 2006 and went through 2007, 2008, 2009, owning real estate in general, it was a tough time. It was a tough time for me. It was so tough. I remember this. Um, my business partner was driving to work one day and he's a notorious speeder speeds wherever he goes. I won't let him drive when I'm in the car with him. I'm always driving. But it was in the depths of the market and he, pull, he got pulled over by the cop. And the cop was going through the, you know, pulling him over, about to give him a ticket. The cop says, well, tell me, you know, what, what's your job, son? And the, my business partner, Alex, says, well, I'm, I'm in real estate. And the cop says, oh, man, I feel really bad for you. I'm going to let you off on this one. But <laughs> So, I mean, that was just the state of things. You know, nobody wanted to talk about people being in real estate. Everybody was running um, and it was really painful. So my business partners and I at that time started to look and see what was going right in our business, what was going wrong. There was a lot that was going wrong, obviously. But we started to like look at the financials and what we noticed is that we were losing money on properties that we were trying to speculate on. We were losing money on properties that we were trying to buy and sell at a higher price. What was actually working was rental properties, right? Because even though the market had crashed, rent rates do not follow home prices. So those 40 rental properties that I had acquired back in 2006 were still kicking out this positive cash flow. And it was like this epiphany for us at that moment. We realized that we were spending all of our efforts doing all these activities that we're losing us all this money. And the thing that was sort of that, the thing that was thriving, even as the market crashed around it, was our rental property portfolio. And we're like, holy cow, we're missing. We're missing the boat here. 
the other thing that we really had going for us is, you know, we were 20 somethings. We were, there were three of us at that time. And how many, three, you know, 20 somethings buy 40 rental properties, right? I did not come from, from a family of wealth or from a family of privilege or from a family of real estate knowledge. My business partners didn't either. You know, this was something that we created on our own. And it was an intriguing story. And so for these first few years, we had friends and family and clients and folks that we had shared our stories with that were intrigued. And they were constantly saying, you know, how are you guys doing? How did you, how'd you build this portfolio of rental property? How are you doing this? And I just remember the epiphany that we had. And we said, you know what? We've been ignoring all those. That, those are people asking us to do something for them. Those are people who want to share that same type of experience. We ignored them for like three years. <laughs> and it took this, this terrible crash for us to realize what the combination of our true passion and what was really working for us and the combination of what we were really built to do because we were doing it so well. And so at that point, we stopped doing other things. All those 47 things I rattled off that we were doing in the beginning no longer became our business. And our business became taking this portfolio of rental properties that we had created for ourselves and packaging that same experience for you or for you or for you, somebody who may not be that person who's going to want to go and pound the pavement and make all those offers and renovate those properties and do all the management. We wanted to package this investment for others so that we could build a rental property portfolio for them. So that became our mission. That became what we, uh, what we did. That was our, what we call our hedgehog, which is the thing that we, are, we do over and over and over again. So I've taken you now from 2006 to about 2008 or 2009. And from then on, we have just absolutely focused, laser focused on our turnkey rental property portfolios. And that's what we do with Candice's wonderful introduction there. As we've been able to, to grow these portfolios, we've been able to serve clients, over a thousand clients now, come from 43 states, 13 countries. And the coolest thing is the way that we get to do it. We get to work with really wonderful clients and we get to work with a really wonderful team. Uh, and, and our culture is something that is just absolutely so crucial. Sir, I know you had, you had raised your hand. Did you have a question? Okay. Well, you know, this is meant to be interactive. So if you guys have questions, certainly don't hold back. Um, in, in your timeline, 2006, business crash, money was easy. Mm -hmm. 2009, trying to get money out of a bank or anything else in the bar. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll make sure we address that. And I have made sure that we have time for question and answer at the end of the session. And I know some of our folks online are able to, to write in questions. We're gonna make sure we answer all of those questions today. And for all of us here that are, that are here, I'm gonna make sure I'm here to answer those questions personally for you guys, even after we turn off the recording. Um, so about financing, how did we do it? That's a, that's a long answer. We'll probably take that and talk about that one-on-one -on -one for sure. Um, but you know, times were tough. And from those tough times, we then built this model, which has really just become this, this this wonderful success stories for us, for our clients, uh, and for our team. So, you know, we've been able to win some really wonderful awards here. We've won fastest growing company, as Candace mentioned there, 2011, 12, 13, 14, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years in a row, fastest growing companies. Uh, Jacksonville Business Journal recognizes us, Inc. 500 recognizes us. Uh, but out of all the awards, as I was mentioning, our culture and our team is what we believe really sets us apart. So best places to work is something that we really care about. We've won that award every year. We won it again this year, except for 2013. We didn't win it in 2013. I don't know what happened. So we, uh, and Companies with Heart is another award that we, we absolutely care about here. Um, and we've been recognized in the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal found out that we were uh, pioneers of this build to rent model, which is where we take new construction rental properties and we turn those into assets for, for clients like yourselves, right? It's not just the renovated properties anymore. It's brand new construction. And so we were on the forefront of that. They wrote about us in, in 2013, put us on the front page. That was super cool. My mom really loved the fact that we were on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. I bought about a thousand copies for her. Um, we've been on the front page of, uh, of New York Times, Bloomberg, Jacksonville Business Journal. But the thing that I think has moved us the most in our, our journey so far is what we've been able to do to impact the lives of the community around us. This is a picture of a newsletter or a newspaper article that was written about uh, a donation from JWB. So last year, through the, our charitable efforts, uh, we have a charity called JWB Cares. Uh, through our efforts and through the efforts of our clients, our team, our network of builders and contractors, we all came together. We raised over $75,000 through our charity golf tournament, and we donated a brand new construction home to a wounded warrior. Is that pretty cool? 
I met this, this wounded warrior. His name is Rick. Obviously, we were there um, when, we, when, when we gave him the keys to the home. The news uh, stations were there. The, the papers were there. They were writing it up. It was this really amazing uh, experience. And I'll tell you, the thing that still gives me chills today is when, when Rick understood what was, what was given to him, he pulled me aside. And if a military man pulls you aside, right? Rick had served uh, and had un undergone, uh, he had severe head trauma and had really suffered in his life. He had PTSD, he was, went through a divorce, he didn't have a, a home for his son and him. Um, and when somebody of that stature pulls you aside, as he did me, I, I gave him my full attention, of course. And he, he looked at me and he had a little bit of tears in his eyes, but just the most stern look on his face. And he said, Greg, you and your team are the type of people I would give my life for. Yeah, it was really impactful. And you know, at the core of it, that's what we're here to do. We're here to change people's lives and rental properties is a function. It's a, it's a way to do that for our team. So, but let's talk a little bit more about you all, what you're thinking, what you're doing with your money. What are your peers doing with your money, right? Why are people investing in rental properties and moving away from the stock market, right? Uh, have any of you had any thoughts about maybe taking money out of the stock market and putting it into something like rental properties? Raise your hand if you have, right? What's one reason that you're thinking about doing that? Security, right? Profit potential, better returns potentially. How about consistency of, of the returns, right? You know, what you find in the, in the stock market, if you, you look over the long haul, the returns are not bad, right? Lack of returns typically is not the number one reason why people are looking for an alternative from the stock market, right? It's the volatility, right? It's the chance that when you are on the doorstep of retirement and you have all of your money in the stock market that one of our world leaders does something terrible or one, uh, you know, God forbid, a natural disaster happens or some economy changes things, right? And all of a sudden, everything that you have is up and down and, and all over. And that's what keeps people up late at night, right? That can't work for some people. So it's not, it, it is the lack of volatility that is the number one reason. And as I think back to my experience, which I just shared with you back in 2006 and 2009, those rental properties, right? Why did I have this epiphany? It was because I understood that in the most volatile time that hopefully I'll ever see in real estate, there was consistent income coming in. And that's when I fell in love with it. So there are a few keys. Oh, we got somebody else who's interested. <laughs> see, he's really, the phone, that guy's really passionate about consistency as well, right? <laughs> that is okay, sir. Um, so, so I wanted to share with you why I love rental properties. And I also wanted to share with you the three most important lessons that I have taken from my own experience and from the experience of serving over a thousand clients who we have done the exact same thing for. And that's what I'm gonna share with you today, okay? Uh, the number one key is something that I want, you, I want you all to write it down, okay? This is something that is super important. And if you've, if you've talked to a lot of property managers or if you've talked to a lot of realtors, you haven't heard this as being the most important thing, but I'm telling you that it is, okay? The number one key is to focus on long-term tenant stays if you want to win in rental properties, okay? That means there are some other things that people talk about a lot that aren't nearly as important, okay? We're gonna talk about long-term re uh, residence stays and why this is the single greatest thing of importance to you and why you need to align yourself with a teammate who truly gets it. I'm gonna share a story with you first. This is Matt and Alicia, uh, excuse me, Matt and Sarah. Matt and Sarah came to us I uh, live in, in, in uh, Fort Lauderdale, uh, so not in Jacksonville. And they came to us, they were in a world of trouble, all right? Now, going back to the time when the market had crashed, this was 2012 when Matt started to acquire his portfolio. So the market had crashed. It was a great time to be buying properties in 2012, wasn't it? So Matt saw that. He timed the market perfectly. He bought 75 properties. So he put a significant portion of his wealth into rental properties at that point in time, which was a great move but he chose the wrong property manager. He was in a world of trouble. Of these 75 houses, Matt came to us and said, I need you guys to, to take a different approach. What's, what I'm doing right now is being cash flow negative times 75 houses and it's killing me, okay? So Matt said, I'm coming to you, but I need to prepare you. There is a ton of maintenance work that needs to be done on my rental properties. 
And we were like, yeah, I, I'm sure you got 75 properties. I'm sure it's a lot. Hey, listen, we can handle it. Over $200,000 worth of maintenance items were required to get Matt's properties back into decent rental shape. $200,000. You all seem like you can take that. <laughs> That's a lot of money for a rental property portfolio. And we You got $200,000 in your pocket, my friend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're right, $3,000 per property, right? It, that sounds reasonable, but if it's all hitting at the same time, right? Um, and so, you know, he was not in a good, good state. And we said, well, what, what's going on? What, uh, what is the average duration of your tenants? What are they staying? It was less than one year, right? So what you find is that if you have short-term tenant stays, you're going to get killed with the maintenance costs that come with putting the house back into rental shape after a turn, right? Maintenance just doesn't happen in a straight line. Maintenance happens very little, very little, very little while your resident's in the home. And then when they leave, there's a big bang, right? There's a big punch to the gut, right? It's not fun. So this is what Matt was experiencing over and over and over again. And we said, Matt, we're going to do it differently. Matt, we focus on long-term tenant stays. One of the big ways that we do that is we sign long-term leases. So whereas 99.9% .9 of the world out there signs one-year leases, we're not do, we don't do that. In my office, when a resident comes to potentially rent a home with us, and they are the most wonderful resident, but they want to sign a one-year lease, we politely tell them that, I'm sorry, you're not qualified to rent with us. We only serve renters that sign two- and three-year leases. And in addition to that, we re-sign over 70% of our leases. We focus on re-signing as if it's a sales opportunity. You should see the people in my office talk about their, their percentages of re-signs. Every, every week in our team meeting, we talk about the, the number of re-signs that we make because I understand that when I do that, I'm putting thousands of dollars into the pocket of a client, right? Re-signs, long-term tenant stays, these are the mechanisms that you need in order to achieve long-term tenant stays. And so we put Matt on this program, on our program, to be able to achieve long-term tenant stays. And in seven months, we were able to take his average lease term. Now, at this point, I was seven months in. I didn't know his average duration of tenant stay at that point. But uh, what I looked at is his average lease term. It was a 12-month lease term, and in seven months, his average lease term across all 75 properties up to 29 months. At the same time, we were able to increase his rents. $71 and increase his overall portfolio 19% in seven months. Is that pretty cool? The basis of that was re-signing. The basis of that was extending the relationship that we had with residents. Let me tell you why we, because there's obviously numbers and metrics behind why we expect to, to keep long-term residents, why we know it's so critical. It comes down to this three-year rule. We'll look at the numbers here in just a second. But if you run the numbers, you need to keep your resident in your home at least three years in order for you to achieve your rate of return goals. In our office, we call it the three-year rule. Has anybody heard of the three-year rule? No, because property managers, typical real estate professionals, they don't think in terms of three-year rules for rental properties. If they did, would they sign one-year leases? No. Has anybody ever had a rental property where you signed longer than a one-year lease? I know you. For all of you, this is my, this is my dad. <laughs> my dad just walked in here. I called him up on the way down here. I was like, Pops, I'm going to be speaking here at Newview. I haven't seen him in a while. I was on a cruise last week. I was like, hey, Dad, you want to come? He's like, yeah. Let me, I don't know where you were, but I think you, you just ran over here, right? <laughs> so, so, um, so I know you. My dad's a client of ours, of course. Um, but it's not normal to have less than, uh, or it's not normal to have more than a one-year lease. It's just not done unless you have felt the pain of turnover, unless you have felt the pain of maintenance and vacancy costs, then you'll quickly understand. And here are some numbers here. So hopefully all of you in here can see this. And I know in, in webinar land, you guys are, are probably looking at the screen here. This is a typical uh, investment property in Jacksonville. This is our, one of our brand new construction homes. Sales price of 160,000, three bedrooms, two baths. Looks, looks wonderful. Estimated rent rate is 1150. That's what I want you to pay attention to. Because we've done this over and over and over again, and we've actually tracked the returns of all of our clients, we know that what we're gonna find is a 4% loss for vacancy cost and 4% loss for maintenance. 
That means that I'm taking the 1150 that I'm expecting on a monthly basis, and I know that uh, each month I'm going to lose 4% on average. And then, and then I take that over the year, and I know what I'm going to lose each year, what I prepare all of our clients to expect that you are going to lose when it comes to maintenance and vacancy costs. Okay? So if you run the numbers here, you're going to find that your estimated annual vacancy costs are a little bit over $1,100. That's real life. Okay? That's our numbers. And that's assuming that the property is going to turn over. Actually, it's over four years for us. Our average duration of tenant stay is actually 49 months. So that's what those numbers are based on. Does that make sense to everybody? 4% of the estimated monthly rent. You, of course, can annualize that. So if you took 4% of this number, 1150, and multiplied that times 12, you would get your loss for vacancy. If you took another 4% of 1150 and multiplied it times 12, then you would get your maintenance loss. And if you combine those every year, you would lose about $1,100. Does that make sense to everybody? It's pretty crucial that, you know, if, if we're, and please stop me if you'd like me to go through this a little bit more in detail, because this is the basis of why the three-year rule matters, right? So 1,100 bucks, are we all, we all good? All right, webinar land, they told me they were good, that we're good, so I got the thumbs up from them. Well, let's look at what happens when your resident leaves or the property turns over, okay? Well, what you're gonna have is, you still have to make those mortgage payments, don't you? The bank doesn't give you a break, right? So we call that PITI, right? Principal, interest, taxes, and? Insurance, there we go. Um, so for an, average, uh, for an average timeline of getting the home rented again, for us it's about 45 days. So for 45 days, you will have made those PITI payments. On that property right there, it comes out to about $1,300. And here's something else, that especially if you're newer in owning rental properties, I think a lot of people come in with the idea that the security deposit that you hold from a resident is gonna cover the repairs when they turn over. And I'm here to tell you, that's not real. That's not real. The only place that that's real is when you're renting in the really, really, really nice neighborhoods. And if you're doing that, you're not making positive cash flow. So if you are in this positive cash flow type of model, you should expect that you're going to put money back into your rental property when it turns over. Does that happen, Dad? Yes. There you go, right? <laughs> he knows, okay? It happens, right? We have this conversation when it needs to be had with all of our clients. Listen. This is real life, you need to expect to put money in. Again, this is why the three-year rule matters. So you've got $2,000 on average that you're gonna put back into the rental property when it turns over, and you've got 3,300 bucks there. So if I know that I'm gonna lose $1,100 every single year, I need to keep people in there three years, right? Think about if I was turning the property every year, right? I would have much larger than $3,300 worth of costs. Right? I would have three times the repair budget. There is no way that if I settled for one year leases that I would wind up in a macro sense hitting my return estimates. Do we all agree with that? Right? Yes, sir. What's the incentive for them to get the three-year So the question for some of those who, who can't hear in, in the webinar world, so the question is what's the incentive for them to go for a three-year lease? That's a wonderful question. Um, we do a lot to build the relationship with the resident, I'm sure, and we can talk a lot more about that. But to give you the simple answer, we hold rent steady for them for a number of years. So for a resident, when they come and they want to rent with us, we politely explain that if you sign a three-year lease with us, we're going to keep your rents con uh, consistent for three years. And in a market like this, if you're a renter, where you see rents rising year after year over year, is that really worth it to you? And oh, by the way, you got to rent a brand new construction home. Who, for those of us who are renting homes, I never rented a brand new construction home. I don't know if anybody else out there has ever rented a brand new construction home. But if I had that opportunity, I'd probably pay a premium for rent. I'd probably sign up for that three-year lease. And then if you told me that it was going to be, be constant, um, you know, certainly a wonderful incentive. Great question there. What's your name, sir? Algis. Algis. Thank you for your questions, Algis. Um, so this is the basis of the three-year rule, right? You need a three-year tenant or resident to make the model work. But again, the question is, why don't property management companies sign long-term leases? So who here has an idea about why property management companies do not sign long-term leases, right? 
if these are the, the agents that you're hiring to protect your investment, to maximize your return, I just showed you the numbers here. They need to be keeping people in the homes for three years, but they're not. Why, why is it ages? Okay. I, w I was about to say, you're, you're just a very optimistic person on, on the first one. <laughs> um, the quality of the rent, I wouldn't be too concerned about. The second one, and say it again, if you wouldn't mind. Well, so what, it, it's Algis, right? Did I pronounce that right? So what Algis said is that they make more money every time they put a new resident in your home. Did anybody ever think about that? No? When a property management company turns a property over, it's actually a significant income stream to them. We're gonna break these numbers down. You, can, you guys can tell them the numbers, right? So we're gonna break the numbers down. And I also, I own JWB Property Management. It's a part of our companies, right? We have property management in-house. So I own a property management company. Last night, yesterday afternoon, when we were reviewing the numbers, I looked at our property management company. I can tell you what the numbers actually look like. The other thing to consider is, is it for the entire renting population out there, are there a lot of residents out there that are uh, expecting to sign three-year leases? No the standard way to do it is to sign a one-year lease, right? So there's a certain retraining of the market. There's a certain, there's extra work that's required to find the three-year residents who are qualified versus just the one-year residents that are qualified, right? That's a lot of extra work, right? So what Al just pointed out is that they make less money if they sign long-term leases, but they also have to work really hard, okay? Let's look at the money component, all right? So I want all of us in here to assume that we are owners of a property management company, okay? Look at it from this lens. The first way that you're gonna earn money is through your tenant placement fee, okay? Your tenant placement fee, who here knows what a tenant placement fee is? Is, is it yeah. Erica? Thank you, Erica. Yes, what's a tenant placement fee? It's the first month or after the first month. Okay, and that goes towards placing the tenant, right? When they find a person who is qualified to be in the home, that fee is what the, the property management company is going to earn for placing that tenant. And when is it paid typically? Yeah, when they close, when they move in. So think of it as sort of day one of the renting relationship with that person, right? The next way they're gonna make money is through management fees, okay? Your typical management fees are equal to 10% of monthly rent, okay? This is what they earn for collecting the rent, establishing the relationship with the resident, handling the maintenance issues, all those things that you typically come to expect from a property management company, okay? So tenant placement fees equal to one month's rent is pretty standard and paid day one. Uh, monthly management fees are 10% of the rent collected. So we're gonna take a property and we're gonna expect that the, we're gonna say the rent is $1,000 on this property for this example, okay? How much money does the property management company make day one when they place the tenant? $1,000, right? Tenant placement is equal to one month's rent. They place a $1,000 resident, the rent of $1,000. That tenant placement fee is equal, equal to $1,000 of income for that property management company. Now, collecting the rent, okay? After one year, that means they collected $1,000 of rent every single month. If you take 10% of that, how much is that? 100 bucks, right? Earn 100 bucks a month. Times 12 gets us to 1,200 bucks for the entire year. Okay, so you're an owner of a property management company. You're focused on the best dollar per hour's activity for you, right? You're focusing on the most profitable activities, okay? Which would you do if I came to you and I said, listen, for a couple weeks of work, I can give you $1,000, or would you rather work an entire year doing property management services? Would you rather collect the rent? Would you rather handle the maintenance issues? Would you rather do the accounting? Would you rather do the customer service? Would you rather handle everything that a property manager handles and make $1,200 at the end of the year? Which would you rather do, sir? You take the thousand, you'd walk away, right? We're all passive investors here at Newview, right? I mean, you want people like me managing your property. You don't want to do it, right? Right? If you could make $1,000 day one or make $1,200 at the end of the year, all of us in this room are shaking our heads that we would take the $1,000. We would do the tenant placement. This is how property management companies run, okay? And I'm not here to say that all property management companies are out there to replace your residents over and over and over again. That's not my mentality. But what I'm telling you is that you're not gonna see a lot of initiatives by standard property management companies 
to drop the recurring revenue of tenant placement fees, right? That's why the standard is one year and the standard is staying at one year because it would require property management companies to lose out on that income, right? If you went to two year leases, just roughly speaking, you're gonna cut that revenue in half. If you went to three year leases, you're cutting it by a third. Why on earth would you do that, right? As a property manager. And you're gonna have to work two or three times harder. Do we all see how this works now? Okay, is this a little bit of new information for some of us? Yeah? Property management companies are not all created equal, okay? In fact, when you actually run the numbers, and I can share this with you because I look at the books, 25 to 55, excuse me, 25 to 50% of revenues from property management companies come from tenant placement fees, okay? So now if you're taking 25 to 50% of a company's revenue, that company's not gonna be in business very long <laughs> if it continues to do that. It has to have other ways for it to make money for long-term leases to work. Okay, this is the reason why you don't think see things changing. Okay, yes, sir. Um, in your complex, if you sign a two year lease, is the charge for the tenant placement different than a one month lease, one year lease? So, the question is, is the tenant placement fee different if you sign a three year lease in JWB versus if you sign a lower, a, like a we don't sign one year leases, but some property management fee charge more if they sign. Yeah, so what he's pointing out is some property management companies charge more the longer the lease term that they, they sign. We don't. We don't. We start charge one tenant placement fee, no matter if it's not a three-year lease or, or whatnot. But that's a good point, right? What I want to share with you is, is, you know, JWB is different, right? We sell properties along with doing property management services. Our property management is a function of delivering overall returns so that you come back to us and buy more and more properties, fill your portfolio. We have referrals and all that good stuff. I mean, so that's why it makes sense for for us and for other turnkey companies. That's why it typically makes sense for them to do it. What I wanna share with you if, you, if you work with a standard property manager, I want you to make sure that your goals are aligned. This is a conversation you need to have up front. And the conversation, this is something else I'd like you to write down, is that before you decide to do business with a property manager, make sure that that property manager is making more money when your tenant or resident stays longer. It's as simple as that. When you meet with somebody, make sure that their business operates so that they are gonna make more money when their tenant stays longer. Make sense, everyone? Good tip? Very cool, very cool. All right, so key number two. Invest in a growth market and simply, hold on. Invest in a growth market and simply hold on. Yes, I'll just. Hey, what do you mean by growth market? Oh, I'm gonna get there. <laughs> Don't you worry, my friend. Uh, he asked, what, what, uh, what do I mean by a growth market? And that's what we're going to get into right now. I want to tell you a story of Matt and Alicia. All right? Matt and Alicia, super young couple. I uh, got to know them many years ago, uh, even before they got married. Matt's an organic grain broker in uh, Little Rock. And um, amazing, amazing couple. He's done quite well for himself. But he had his money in the stock market as well. And he was looking for an alternative. He came to, to us at JWB. And we were able to, to start to build his portfolio. For him. But I remember talking to Matt as I was bringing him on as a client and I, I said, all right, Matt, no, I know why this makes sense for you. I know why it makes sense to me, but tell me in your words why this makes sense for you. Why are you choosing Jacksonville to invest in when you live in Arkansas and you've got other cash flow markets that are closer to you in Arkansas, right? That might even produce a little bit more cash flow than Jacksonville. Why are you choosing to put a significant amount of your wealth here in Jacksonville? And he said, well, Greg, what I want to find is number one, the best team to work with. So I like you, which was pretty cool. And then number two, he said that for me, I need to make sure that I invest in a market that has positive cash flow. But when I get there, the next thing that I look at, that's my first qualifier, cash flow, positive cash flow. But when I get there, I then want to look at growth opportunities for that market. Right? I want to look at the economics of that market. I want to look at population growth. I want to make sure more people are moving there because what he understood is that the greatest impact to your returns after holding on to rental properties for 10 years or 20 years is not that additional 25 bucks a month of cash flow. Right? It's that 4% appreciation versus 2% appreciation. And that's why he came to Jacksonville. What do you know? That happens to be my mentality as well, obviously, right? Number one is positive cash flow. That's the first qualifier. But there are so many investors out here 
that only look at cash flow. And they say, I'm not going to focus on growth. I'm not going to focus on growth. But all, all the while they say, well, I want to hold on to this portfolio for 20 years. And I'm like, man, you are missing out on a huge opportunity. So I put a, a picture up here of Top Golf. So uh, Matt was, he's really, uh, he's a business owner and he really cares about businesses that are moving into uh, the market and into Jacksonville was one, obviously one market he pays attention to. And he loves Top Golf. This is a picture from his, uh, from his bachelor party before he got married. He sent this to me. He's like, man, I love Top Golf. And so I just happened to mention to him at that point, he had about five or six properties with us. And I said, well, Matt, you know, we got a Top Golf here in Jacksonville. And he's like, oh, no way. And he's like, hey, can I buy a few more properties from you? <laughs> so I don't know if it was exactly because of Top Golf that he's, he's built up his portfolio, but he's up to 15 properties that he owns with us now. And I think he bought like five or six based on, on Top Golf being there. So I'll have, to, I'll have to send them a commission there. Um, but this is Matt and Alicia. And, and I show this to you. Um, this is what we do with all of our clients that come on board. Um, you know, when you are investing in the stock market, generally, if you sit down with a financial advisor, one of the first things you're going to do is you're going to understand what your plan is, right? You're going to look strategically at the money that you have, the resources that you have, and how do I get to X amount of income at some certain year right there, right? My question is, why don't we do that in rental properties, right? So that's what we do. So we sit down with our clients. We want to map out what success means to them. So for Matt and Alicia, they wanted to understand or they wanted to experience retirement early and financial freedom. For them, that meant an actual income each month of about $11,000 a month. And they said, if you can do that for me, that will free up our time to go and do what we want to do. I said, that sounds amazing. So we broke it down. We realized that, that comes down to 16 rental properties. And they've worked their way up. They're now up to 15 rental properties. An amazing success story. And we also, of course, want to hold them accountable. Well, they want to hold themselves accountable to the timeline that they wanted to get there. So this year, 2019 is the year that they're going to get there, uh, which, is, which is just super exciting. Uh, Matt and Alicia have invested over a million dollars with us to be able to do that. Um, and we've been able to turn this into this income stream. Candace, yes, how can I help? You know what, I think I, I didn't put the, the year on here. Uh, it must have been 2013 or so, 2014. That's when they started, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and it's just been a, a continual, what we actually do with our clients is we understand the amount of income that they are expected to receive every single month, excuse me, every single year from their salary, from any bonuses they may have. And, and we think in terms of how many are you going to add each and every year, get you on that plan and do that. And that's worked really well for Matt and Alicia. Um, and of course, Top Golf. So, um, but here's my, here's my big thing that I don't think people get. Most people, when we talk about home price appreciation, they say, I don't want to talk about that. I don't believe in it. I can't count on it, right? But I'm sitting here, I'm standing here telling you that you can count on home price appreciation when analyzing investments, when analyzing rental properties. You can count on home price appreciation, but only when, but only when, who's got it? Uh, you, I talk to you all the time. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get any of your answers. <laughs> what? But only when what? Oh, good. I'm glad I stumped. Oh, yes, ma'am. When you sell? Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, when you sell, you're right. But if you're holding on to rental properties, you can account on home price appreciation, but only when you have a long-term hold mentality. When only when you're planning on holding on to this thing for at least 10 years or 20 years. If you are in this game to buy a rental property and sell in the next year or two, this message that I'm sharing with you right now is, is not for you. This should not apply. You're more of speculating if you're talking about home price appreciation, right? It is very hard to know what you can count on for home price appreciation in any type of timeline less than 10 years, even five years. It's hard to, hard to do, right? Three years, don't even, don't even bother betting on home price appreciation. What, I'll just, what, what percentage? Gosh, you are so good, my friend. I'm an accountant. Yeah, I, got, I think I got it on the next slide. <laughs> um, and so you can count on this if you are in this game to hold on for 10 or 20 years because I'm going to show you the data. You know I'm a numbers guy. I'm going to show you the data here, okay? All right, what I'm showing you here is a graph of home prices across the entire country. We've gone from 1990, excuse me, 1988 to 2018, 30 years there, okay? And what you see is that home price appreciation on average is 3.75%. 
Remember when we were talking about consistency? Do you see a whole lot of variability here, right? This line, this red line right there is the trend line. That's that 3.75%. That is the average appreciation rate, okay? The other dots, the blue ones, I think those are blue. I'm colorblind. Those are blue? Okay, good. Um, those blue dots are uh, what the actual home prices have been across the entire country at different years, right? So there's not a whole lot of variability here, right? Things tend to repeat themselves, and they don't vary all that much across the entire country. Okay? What you're going to find is that in metros, in cities like Jacksonville, and in other cities, things tend to return to the norm after 10 or 20 year cycles. You may have heard this. Real estate cycles tend to repeat themselves every 10 or 20 years. And what that really means is if you look at the home price appreciation rates over a 10 or a 20 year span, you cut it up any 10 or 20 year span, you're typically gonna find that same home price appreciation in a market. Is that pretty cool, right? So if, if that's the case, then why aren't we looking at home price appreciation when we're making decisions on rental property portfolios, is my question, right? We should. And if you're not, you're losing a huge opportunity cost. And again, I'm gonna show you what that looks like if you don't look at it in just a second here. But you asked, was our home price appreciation, I think, in Jacksonville, was that your question, this? Yep, so uh, our home price appreciation, if you look over the last 27 years, uh, it's 4.32%. Okay, the, the across the entire country is 3.75%, Jacksonville's 4.32%. So um, that's a really high number compared. Now, again, when you're looking across the country, you've got markets out there that have no chance of ever being a cash flow market, right? Most cities in California, New York, Virginia, all those high price markets, right? Those factor into the overall, uh, you know, overall appreciation average. So for Jacksonville to be on point with the entire market means that a lot of people are moving to Jacksonville. And that's driving demand over the long haul, which is a really good thing. But I wanna show you something that even blew my mind away when I put these, these stats, I put these stats together a while ago, um, but I continue to update them. What I'm showing you here are median home prices from 2001 to the end of 2018. And this is just for Jacksonville, okay? Now the concept here is I've just told you that things tend to repeat themselves, they tend to come back to the norm. Would we all agree that from 2001 to 2018, we had a huge spike up and we had a huge drop in prices, right? Probably the most volatile home prices we will see in our lifetime, I hope, right? In Jacksonville and across the country. But what I'm here to show you here is this trend line is that 4.32% line, that average appreciation rate in Jacksonville over the last 27 years, okay? This blue line are actual median home sales prices in Jacksonville. From 2001 to 2018, would you believe that we came back to the norm of that 4.3% line, even in the most volatile real estate market Jacksonville has seen? That should really mean something to you guys, right? That should mean that over the long haul, again, if you're planning on holding on to this thing for 10 years, 20 years or longer, you should be looking at home price appreciation. Make sense? Very good, very good. So what I, what, I, what I want to invite you to do is to take off your cash flow blinders. This is what I tell people, right? Folks say, well, I'm only gonna pay attention to this market or that market because it's the best rent to price ratio. And what I'm telling you is your job as an investor is not to get the most cash flow. Your job is to get the best risk adjusted return. And if you're not paying attention to the other profit centers like home price appreciation or tax savings or principal pay down, if you're not paying attention to these other profit centers, you're not doing your job. You're gonna wind up in 10 years or 20 years and you're gonna look at your portfolio and you're gonna see a huge opportunity missed. So again, what I am not telling you to do is I do not want you to go to the markets that have the highest appreciation rates that have, that have happened over time and invest there, right? What's the number one qualifier for an investment? It's positive, positive cash flow. Positive cash flow. I'll just, what were you on that one, man? <laughs> I called you out on that, didn't I? Um, positive cash flow. That is your entrance for making a good rental property decision. Once you've accomplished that, the next thing that you need to do to take the best risk adjusted returns is to look at appreciation in that market. Look at the long term appreciation in that market. Okay? So, what do you know? I've done that for you. So I've, I told some of the folks who were here earlier that I'm a huge Pittsburgh Steelers fan. 
I credit that to my dad right there. We're from Pittsburgh. Um, he was born there. I wasn't born there. He was born down here. But, um, but I always take every opportunity I can to talk trash about Cleveland, right? If you're from Pittsburgh, you're going to talk trash about Cleveland. Um, it just so happens that I pulled some of the most uh, common cash flow markets out there, and I pulled the data from the Federal Housing Finance Agency, and I looked at what their long-term appreciation rates have been over the last 27 years. For some of you here who are, who are here in, 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 in the space right now, it's kind of hard to see, but 4.3% is Jacksonville. You've got Kansas City, Birmingham, Memphis, and Cleveland. Cleveland is down below 2.5% over 27 and a half years. Now, what does that really mean in dollars? I'm glad you asked. If you had made a decision to buy a rental property for $100,000 in Cleveland in 1991, your property in 2018 would be worth about $188,000. Pretty good, right? I mean, 88 grand of appreciation, uh, that's not bad, right? What that also goes to show is that even in a market that has low pop, actually people are leaving Cleveland, so it has negative population growth, real estate is known to be something that kind of tracks inflation, so that, that's pretty good, right? It's, it's certainly not bad, $88,000. But it makes you feel pretty bad when you consider what you could have had if you bought that same rental property in Jacksonville. If you bought that rental property for $100,000 in 1991 in Jacksonville, anybody want to take a guess at what it'd be worth today? Al just is an accountant. He told me he's an accountant. <laughs> That's a good guess. 250 was the guess. Anybody else out there? 500,000? 230? Oh my goodness. Look at you over there. I saw you crunching your numbers. Wow, $313,000. All right, so what we need to grasp the concept, like 2.5% versus 4.3% doesn't sound that impactful. That doesn't make me, you know, perk my ears up or anything. But these are $100,000 assets times 20 years that you're going to be holding on to this thing. And it really matters, right? That's $125,000 of additional return because you invested in a market that already told you it was more likely to appreciate. Right? The data's there. You just got to pay attention to it. And then if you're like our clients, and many of you I know have goals to replace a certain amount of income coming from rental properties. And, I mean, you're not thinking about one rental property. You're thinking about five. You're thinking about 10. Right? You made the same decision times 10 rental properties in Jacksonville versus Cleveland. That's that opportunity cost that is there when you don't pay attention to all the growth factors. That is that opportunity cost that investors are missing. Make sense? Okay. We're going to talk. My third key here is consistency. I've mentioned this a number of times. It's like my buzzword in the office. I say it all the time. That's what we are here to produce for clients is consistency. That's why they're coming to us. And I'm here to tell you that consistency to me means three or more properties. Okay. For clients that own less than three properties, I am telling them that we are not going to achieve the full consistency that I want for you. And I tell them this before they become clients, right? And I know this because I know it with my own experience and I know it because I look at all the numbers every single month for all of our clients doing this for over 13 years now. And I think it's important to share this up front with folks. Okay. I'm going to share it through, through this story. I've got another really great story here. This is Jim and Stacy. Jim and Stacy told me about this thing called the great American loop. Has anybody heard about the great American loop? No. Okay. Great American loop. That's the picture here. So, Jim and Stacy's goal here, their why, is that they wanted to have this travel fund in retirement. And I asked them, well, I don't usually just let people kind of like off the hook. They say retirement. I'm like, yeah, but what does that really mean to you? They say, well, here's what we want to do. We have always wanted to do the Great American Loop. I was like, well, what's that? They said, the Great American Loop is, Jim was who I was speaking with. Jim says, well, it's Stacy and I, and we get on a boat in Florida, and we go all the way up the eastern seaboard, all the way around the Great Lakes, down to Mississippi, come all the way back, and we spend six to nine months on a boat, and we do the Great American Loop. And at first, I was like, man, that is a really cool story. I'm super excited to help you get there. And then I was thinking, man, I don't, I don't know if that would be my, man, I don't know if I could spend six to nine months on a boat. <laughs> I like being on a boat for an afternoon, right? <laughs> but for Jim and Stacy, this is what they wanted to do, right? They've got that boating gene, and, and this, is, this was their success. So I thought it was a really cool story, and we said, okay, well, what do we need to do to do that? We need to have a consistent portfolio, right? If you guys 
what was actually going to happen is Jim was going to take a sabbatical from his, from his job. He was allowed to do that for six or nine months. Stacy was going to be able to retire from hers so that they could go ahead and do this. And we said, well, if we're going to do that, we need to have consistent income. And I said, well, let's start talking about what consistent income means. Means It means having a diversified portfolio, not having just one rental property or two rental properties with us. And obviously we, we measured out the amount of income they would need. So $7,000 is what they would need. 10 rental properties is what it was going to take to get them there. They're at eight. And we of course are working towards their next purchase. Um, so I'm gonna break this down for you. Again, a lot of numbers here. I'm gonna point out the ones that are most important here, okay? So this is our individual uh, investment report that we share with all of our clients. It's really cool to see not just what we told you your returns were going to be when you bought the property, but to look at that expected return and compare it to what your actual rates of return are every single month. And we're able to do this for all of our clients every single month. And we're able to track and analyze and measure this thing like you would a, a stock portfolio, right? You're able to identify trends. Why are things going better than we expected? Right? If, if it's not going as well as expected, why is that happening? These are important questions. So we do this through this report. And it's a great way to show you the ups and the downs, right? When I tell, what I tell folks is when you own rental properties, you need to get to three because it's going to be a little bit like a carousel ride, right? When you own three rental properties, you are always going to have issues with one of them. You're always going to have issues with one of them. You're going to have one that you say, oh, man. You know, I've talked to clients who are like, Ah, oh, Greg, I've, you know, they had three, five properties. I say, okay, well, how are things going? They say, well, you know what? Going great. I'm looking at the overall returns. We're doing great. It's just that one property. And I say, okay, yeah, 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 I know. What I know is that three years later when I speak with them, they're going to say the exact same thing. We're going to be talking about a different property, <laughs> right? It's just a carousel. Something bad is going to happen on your rental properties, right? But the reason you need three is because if you only have one or you only have two, then JWB or your property management company is either going to be your shining star or it's going to be your, you know, your goat, right? The, the bad type of goat, not the greatest of all time, like dog, right? Um, and it's not going to serve consistency that way. So you got to have three. But what you see here is that this is when it goes really well. We've had annual lifetime returns of about 8%. We told them to expect about 7%. And it's been between 8 and 9% every single year, right? Steady Eddie, things are great, right? Can you imagine that we had a long-term resident in that one? Absolutely, right? Our average duration is, over, is 49 months, right? Had a long-term resident there. Down here, we had another winner, right? We had annual lifetime returns of 10.3%. We expected right around there, and it's been consistent. It's been, you know, uh, we had one year of about 5% returns, but the rest of them, 9%, 17%, right? We're okay. If it's not consistent, but it's above expectations, are we okay with that, <laughs> right? So things are okay, right? What happened here? For some of you in the room, I know you might not be able to see this, but we had a negative year. We had negative cash flow. We're shaking our heads here, right? Does that happen in real life when you own rental properties? Dad, what happened in real life when you own rental properties? Right? It happens, right? So um, we need to discuss this. It happens when your residence leaves, right? So the way that you, when, when, what, to, what I want you to think about is when you own a rental property, the rental income you're receiving while that rental is, is renting from you, <clears throat> think of that as a surplus. Think of that as extra cash flow that you are storing up that you know you're going to get back at one day. Okay? Don't think of that as the expected returns because if you actually look at the numbers, when your resident is renting from you and they're in your home, by and large, you're going to be overperforming on your returns and you're going to be expected to give some of that back. Right? And giving some of that back means having a negative year when your resident leaves, right? But this happens over and over and over again, right? I own over 300 rental properties today. Do you think that I deal with negative cash flows on certain properties? Yes, do you think I've dealt with evictions and early term, early termination? Do you think Matt and Alicia have dealt with that, Jim and Stacey? Every investor, if you wanna own five or 10 rental properties, you're gonna deal with this. It's real life. And I want you to get mentally ready with it, ready for it, right? It's, it's okay. It's okay if the bottom line is hit. So I want you to think in terms of a portfolio overall, okay? A portfolio mentality. Talk a lot about this with my dad, who's here, right? We talk a lot about how rental properties on an individual basis, I analyze them on an individual basis, right? When one of my properties has an early term or an eviction or something like that, I don't care, to be quite honest, as long as the bottom line is hit, right? Because then I know if I have one that's underperforming, I know that I'm going to have 
two that are overperforming. And that's the way I want to, to teach you all to think about your rental portfolio as well, right? We can't get emotionally involved when a resident does something stupid, it's gonna happen, right? Hold yourself and your property manager accountable to the bottom line. And if your overall portfolio numbers are hit and they're consistent, you're gonna be a happy camper. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, wonderful. I share with clients that in order to achieve consistency, you need three properties. So you should be expecting to put about $150,000 as a minimum into this asset class within one to two years. It's real. If you want consistency, this is what you need to do. Okay. Yeah, question is what percentage down are we putting down? These are typical loans. These are 25% down loans typically is what our clients do. So, you know, it's about $50,000 down payment per rental property gets you to about $150,000, right? Um, the question that I get a lot is, well, do you sell properties to who, clients who only want to buy one property? And, and absolutely we do. We love to work with clients that only want to buy one property day one, right? But I share the same message with them early on that in order to make this work, I care about delivering. I care about being consistent for you. I understand that's why you're coming to me. And I'm sharing with you that we need to make sure that you want to be on board to invest about $150,000 within the first two years for me to do my job. And if that's not okay, let's talk about it right now. And maybe, maybe it's not the right fit, right? But it's so important because I understand that I, I, early on, we sold properties to clients. We only bought one rental property. And I know those conversations were either the best thing ever uh, or, you know, that, that rental property has an issue. And, and there's just lack of consistency. And so once we focus on consistency being our job, this is the conversation that we have. And if consistency is what you're looking for, this is the conversation that you need to have with yourself as well. So I wanted to invite you all, we, we, of course we're gonna be here today. Um, certainly want to talk about um, some of the questions that you all have, um, and we'll, we'll certainly have some time here. But before we do that, if any of you would see value in planning this out like you saw, for Matt and Alicia, or Jim and Stacy, um, This is something that we offer. We do this through our relationship with NewView. We just love our partners here at, at NewView. Um, and it's something that we do uh, typically for current clients. So once a client's on board, we typically sit down and actually map out what their strategy is going to be. Uh, we only have two gentlemen in the office that I have trained personally, that I trust, that understand exactly how to map this process out. And they're generally very busy. Uh, it typically takes a couple of weeks to get on the calendar. Uh, but if it's something that you guys would see value in, uh, you can go to this website, which is jwbplan.com. You can put your information in there and we'll reach out. And we've got some spots that are reserved for you guys here, of course, uh, in, the, in, the, in the room here, for all of you who are watching online. We also make those available for you. You can certainly go there. And, and I'm, of course, I'm here to, to answer all of your questions. So if I haven't met you, let, excuse me, met you yet, um, please come up to me afterwards. And, um, and if this is something that you'd like, We'll get you set up on that phone call, uh, phone call as well. But I did want to leave you with um, what it would be like if you did jump on one of those planning calls with us. Um, the first thing that we're going to ask of you is what is your why? This is my favorite thing about working with our clients. We started to ask their why. Why are you investing? And the reason is it's got to be impactful. It's got to be fun. It's got to be something that's motivating you because the reality is when you're investing in rental properties, there are a lot other fun, more exciting investments that you can make than buying a house for somebody else that you don't even know to live in your house, <laughs> right? You're not doing that because that's a fun or a sexy investment, right? You're doing it because of deferred gratification. You're doing it because there's a big win later on. It might be the Great American Loop, right? Maybe something else that's different. For, for me, my why is that every time I bought a rental property, even back in 2006, I thought of it as, me owning a little bit more of my time. And I care so deeply about spending time with my family. At that point, I didn't have kids, um, but I, I thought I would maybe one day. And I, I wanted to be that dad that didn't have to have a job hold me back from being there at the ballet recital or the soccer game or whatever it may be. So that's my why. It's, it's, it's about owning that time. And, um, and I know all of you have very important whys as well. Um, Here's a really cool story that I'll leave you with. Um, but when you jump on board and on a phone call with us, be prepared. We're going to ask you your why. We're not going to let you get away with just early retirement. That, that doesn't work. It's got to be, what are you going to do in retirement? 
Liz and Steve, two of our favorite clients, this is what they wanted to do in retirement. They came to us over seven years ago, or about seven years ago, and they said, uh, Greg, what we want to do is we want to sell our primary residence. We want a consistent income stream so that we can go and travel the world. We're going to buy a sailboat with the proceeds that we make from our primary residence. We're going to sail the world for, I was like, how long are you going to do that? They said, I don't know. So they, that's what they did. So they, we worked with them. They invested a couple hundred thousand dollars with us. And now the cool thing is that um, when you're a client at JWB, we make, uh, we have monthly phone calls with all of our clients. We understand what their portfolios are doing. We analyze all that good stuff. And so for us, it's really hard to know how to get a hold of them because they're traveling literally around the world. We have to understand, we have to log into their GPS, figure out what port they're in, it might be in Portugal or somewhere else. And, uh, and then we log in and that's how we get to have our phone calls. So this consistent income for them has allowed them to be able to sail the world. Is that pretty cool? Right? This is, these are the stories that we love. Um, so you can see here about seven years, about $100,000 of net rental income for Liz and Steve. And that is what they didn't have before. That's what allows them to sail the world and sell their house. So, yeah, so about a hundred thousand, about an 8% lifetime return for them and a couple hundred thousand dollars for their capital investment. And here are their, here, here are their numbers, their portfolio return. Um, but with that, uh, I, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much to Grace and Candice and the entire New View team. This has just been a wonderful opportunity and thank you for making me get back to my old house here. Uh, thank all of you for being here. This has been a really, um, really wonderful group. Thank you all for being there in, in webinar land. Um, and for anybody that would like for us to, to reserve one of those spots for you, you can go to jwbplan.com or just come up and say hello. Um, with that, I'll open it up for questions. Um, and yes, sir. Greg, you mentioned with some of the charts on, on some of your existing clients, you know, three homes, five homes, eight homes. I just wanted to confirm from my own understanding. Clients with you, when you talk about a home, they are the, they're on the title, they own the home as, it, as opposed to your company being like a real estate investment trust where they only, everybody owns a, a small portion of the whole package. It's a great question. So the question for our viewers out there is how, how do clients actually own those three homes or five homes or eight homes that we were talking about here, right? Okay. It is a very simple process, right? You, if you were a client, you would actually own the home. All right, we simply are selling the house to you. All right, so this is not a pooled investment. This is not a real estate investment trust. This is nothing complicated like that. This is, a part, this, this is simply a seller and a buyer. And at the same time, we package property management services with us. So technically in a separate arrangement, you also hire us as your property manager. It just happens to be done the same closing. It, so very simple process. Does that make sense to everybody out there? Yeah. Fantastic, great question there. Yes, I'll just. Somebody came and gave you uh, $250,000, say. What is, what is the market? How many homes would that buy in the marketplace in Jacksonville today? And are you doing just in Jacksonville still? Yes. We, so the question was if, if a client came to us with $250,000 and said, hey, I want to put this into rental properties, how many homes would that buy? And then are we only in Jacksonville? And we are only in Jacksonville. We're focused on delivering the biggest impact in Jacksonville. That's why we're there. And we also believe that's the best way to serve clients. Because you go to too many markets, you start, start to go back to being a jack of all trades and a master of none. We're, you know, certainly focused on delivering for clients. And then personally, I don't want to move. I love Jacksonville. So that's why we're only here in Jacksonville. Um, how many homes would that be? You know, you can think if this is a conventionally financed purchase, uh, you're putting 25% down, you're typically going to find about a $50,000 down payment. Right? If it's a cash purchase, your, pur your purchase prices are going to be between one hundred and sixty dollars and $200,000. So think maybe, maybe you know, one to maybe two homes uh, for a cash purchase, for con a conventionally financed purchase, four or five. Okay, so the next question is, this is a who do we have to find our own lenders for the uh, other portion of it? Question was, do you have to find your own lenders? No. We have that, we facilitate that for you. Um, so you do not have to worry about finding your own lenders. Because most of model lenders, you know, if you're buying rental property, you get some of the, I do mortgage lending. Yeah. Okay, and a lot of lenders that, you know, there was less than 40%, over 50% on rental property. Yeah, so what Alex is pointing out is not all lenders are created the same. There are very few who understand how to uh, lend on investment properties that have 
the programs to lend on investment properties, specifically in the state of Florida, right? We, we have to jump through a few more hoops there. Uh, we've been doing this for 13 years, sold over a thousand properties. Our core of lenders understands we vetted them out. So not something that you have to worry about with us, but generally something that you have to jump through a few hoops if you go out on your own to do. Candace. Mm -hmm. Yes, great point, especially knowing that we're all here to talk about IRAs, right? Well, when I spoke about conventionally financed purchases being 50% down, or excuse me, $50,000 down, scratch that from your memories because when you invest in an IRA, you cannot get a conventionally financed loan, right? What you have to get is a special type of loan. So as hard as we were saying it is to get conventionally financed loans, non-recourse loans are even tougher, okay? A non-recourse loan means it's a bank or a lending institution that goes into making the loan with you, knowing that if you don't make the payments, they can't attack your credit. They have no recourse against you, right? Banks like making loans when they know they can take the house back, but they also know that if I don't make the payments, they can come after me and know that they can kill my credit for seven years, right? So banks don't generally do this. You have to find a non-recourse lender. Of course, we do. We have great relationships with non-recourse lenders. It's very seamless with us. If, if, if you're going out at it alone, it's gonna be very difficult to find a non-recourse loan out there. You may find a few, but even then, it is very tough to find the ones that actually perform. It's like, you know, you have thousands and thousands of lenders out there, and it's tough to find the ones that perform out of those thousands. Well, you got like five non-recourse lenders out there, right? And they know it. So their customer service and their delivery of, the, of, of what they say is, it's just tough. So expect, Higher interest rates, expect higher uh, down payments, you know, loan to values, right? Um, those uh, are, uh, your down payment percentage is gonna be higher. So it's gonna be tougher. But for us, uh, it's, it's seamless, it's easy. And then the cool thing is that you can actually do a non-recourse loan and build it so that uh, you're cash flow neutral in your retirement accounts. So it's not a, a cash flow negative situation. That's, of course, that's the first rule for me. So great question, Candace. All right, Erica. Um, are you selling the homes at market value? Another great question. So the question was, are we selling the homes at market value? Um, you may have may be referencing this, but not most, most turnkey providers don't do that, right? They sell homes a lot of times above market value. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong um, because they justify it based on the, the rates of return from the cash flow. Uh, but that's not our approach. We sell our homes at market value. All of our price, properties are priced to appraise. Uh, so there are no issues there. And uh, for us, that's just our mentality that we feel like the investment stands on its own by selling it at market value with the cash flows, um, whereas others may not feel that way. But, uh, but yeah, market value for us. What would be market called? Like the term? Yeah. What's the market called that we do? Uh, it's typically known as turnkey rental property investing. So if you search for turnkey rental properties, you'll see us, you'll see a number of other, you know, players. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great, great model. This is again, some, something that's more, uh, you know, new for you. I uh, would really just urge you to, to look into this model. Um, something that, um, you know, has meant a great deal to me personally, really set up um, my family to be able to have this time that we have that that's everything that matters to me. Um, been able to do it for a lot of clients. So, but it's something that requires a commitment to doing it for the long haul. You know, you got to be able to have thick skin, uh, understand that not every bad thing that happens on a rental property is going to be the end of the world, right? Look at that portfolio mindset, I think is really important. Kansas. Well, what's Kansas. fun too is you're, um, you're going to get a non recourse loan inside of your IRA. You're then um, a long term buy and hold strategy is your best bet because you want to make sure that loan pays off for at least a year before you are going to sell that home so that you're not subject to UBFI collapse. Mm. Um, So just like you go to your financial planner and they do it with the stocks, this is in real estate. It's an intangible thing that you want in there, but you're free to do what you're good at all day, every day, without having to, you know, have some student and yeah. You hit the nail right on the head. What Candace was saying is this is built for folks that want this to be passive, which is generally the folks that want to be a part of NewView as well, right? 
I know I'm generalizing here, but this passive approach is what's really intriguing. And most of the time, before kind of this turnkey concept that we came up with way back in the day, it wasn't possible to be passive in rental properties. But what we wanted to model is how passive it is in the stock market and bring that to rental properties. And, and that's, that's what we're trying to create for, for clients out there. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, you having 300 centers. You also showed charts about you know, five big times to use an example, springboarding off this general question of what could have happened all the things. Mm -hmm. If somebody's coming to you with a larger initial buy in, let's say $2 million, right? You can buy at a two fifty two hundred fifty thousand a house, you can buy eight houses and own them free and clear. Mm -hmm. Versus using the 50000 example down payment, you could own 20% of 40 homes. With your mm -hmm. experience you've had in the years you've been in business, the rate of return is better on fewer homes owned, owned fully by the client or better if you diversify over. Great question. And, and just and pay the bank. Say, in, in my mind, the, the immediate reaction, I'm paying money out to another guy, so I'm not going to do as well. Mm -hmm. Does that pan out? A great question. So the question is, let's say that you've got $2 million. What's the best thing for you to do with that $2 million? Is it to buy eight homes that free and clear, right? Or is it for you to buy 40 homes? I think that was just general numbers, right? Down payments. You could do the 40 homes if you used leverage, but is that the right thing to do? The answer is it totally depends on what your goals are, right? What I tell clients is that you know, rate of return, depending on your goals, may be the most important thing for you, but it may not be the most important thing for you, right? So what I would do with you is, is sit down and ask you a few more questions, but I can tell you what, what I do. Now, I'm a younger investor, right? I'm, I'm 36. When I started, when, I built the, when we bought those 40 rental properties, I was 20, 23 or so, 24. Uh, so I had a lot of years ahead of me. Um, the best returns, if you believe that a market is going to appreciate over the long haul, the best returns are to use the power of leverage. You also get advantages of, of tax savings um, that you get to, to write off that combining that actually will give you the highest rate of return if you believe that the property is going to appreciate. Okay? Because if you see 4% appreciation for a year, but you only put 25% down, what you actually see is 16% appreciation on the asset because you're using the power of leverage, okay? But what do you give up if you take on leverage? You give up cash flow? You do, right? You gotta make the bank payments, right? So you give up that cash flow, right? So now, if you are uh, approaching retirement and you come to me and you say, listen, I've got $2 million, but I'm not gonna have another source of income, right? I'm 65 years old. I need this to produce X num number of dollars every single month of income. I might say, you know what? We might take a balanced approach. We might use some leverage. We might say no leverage. We might just say, listen, you have done very well for yourself. The most important thing for you is to know that you have the maximum amount of cash flow coming in every single month. We might say that's the best thing for you, right? So generally speaking, folks that are younger, have more years, right? That have alternative sources of income usually go with leverage they would generally go with your 40 property example in that, in that regard. Um, if you're looking for the best overall returns, that's the way that I would lead you. However, that doesn't, that's not the end all be all in my experience. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, absolutely. Any questions over there in webinar land, Grace? All right, awesome. Any questions in here? You guys have just been wonderful. Thank you guys so much for your time. Very nice.